All right, here we go. We have hip hop royalty in the building. The co lyricist of Public Enemy, one of the greatest hip hop groups of all time, with timeless anthems that are still relevant to this day, like Fight the Power and 911's a Joke. The undisputed greatest hype man of all time, a member of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, and five time Grammy nominee. Reality show titan, it is my extreme honor to welcome Flavor Flav to Vlad TV. Thank you, Vlad. Thank you, man. Thank you, bro. It's an honor to be here with you, kid. Hey, man, listen. I am such a huge fan for such a long time. I remember buying Nation and Millions. I remember the impact the Fear of a Black Planet made. I remember buying Apocalypse, Apocalypse 91, The Enemy Strikes Black. So many classic, timeless songs and you play such a vital role in all those, man. Thank you so much for joining us today. Yo, thank you so much, man, for the support and all that. You know what I'm saying? For real. Uh, that's that's real big to me. And not only that, but thank you for letting me know that you're a huge fan. And you know that word fan? F-A-N? Well, we're going to take the N and turn that shit into an M. That's what you are, a huge fan. Ha! That's what it is, Gotcha. Man. I love that. I love that. Well... We've done brief interviews before, but this is our first real sit down. So I want to get into the whole Flavor Flav story. This is such an important story. So you grew up and you had a very interesting childhood. You know, a lot of kids play with matches and, you know, who play around with fire here and there, but you actually lit your house on fire. I sure did when I was around five years old. You know what I'm saying, and I was up, 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 up uh, I was in my in, in um, my sister's room, and I was playing with a lighter. I was playing with a lighter, and um, I was underneath the bed, and and usually um, like uh, the box spring, up underneath the box spring, there's this type of material that. Get, catch on fire real easy and it's real flammable and stuff. You know what I'm saying? So the lighter hit that flammable material and it started burning and I panicked and I ran from up under the bed and I ran out of the room. The next thing you know, um, the place started smoking up and the whole night I felt so bad. I was so scared. You know what I'm saying? For real. Because I knew I did something bad. And man, I ain't going to lie, but that that fire was crazy. It burnt up all my sister's toys. And yeah, it was crazy. Her dolls and everything. When she came home from school and everything, the walls was all sooty and burnt. And I can remember her coming home crying and Peeling the wall, you peeling the burnt stuff off of the wall, and cry. she was crying over her dolls, and she wanted to really kill me, you know. But I don't think my moms would let her kill me. <laughs> I'm glad she didn't kill me. If she did, I wouldn't be talking to you today, Vlad. But yeah, that was a crazy experience right there, man. Yeah. Okay, so the whole house didn't go. Just that one nah, room? Not the whole house, just mainly that one room. You know what I'm saying? And the whole house could have went, you know what I'm saying? But thank God that we did catch the fire in time. So you go to high school and you become somewhat of a musical prodigy. You started just picking up instruments on your own. Before you knew it, you played like, what, like 15 instruments just, yeah. just naturally? Yeah, yeah I, play, I play 14 right now to... To this date, you know what I'm saying, and um, you know I um, I learned a lot of my instruments by cutting class, hanging out in the band room. You know what I'm saying, and um, when I my first instrument, my first instrument was the organ, mm. and back in the days, on that organ, that's when I taught myself my first song that I played on my own, which was Batman. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yep. Batman was the shit, you know? So anyway, I used to take the turntable, which was called 
I mean, a record player back in those days. We had 45s, you know what I'm uh-huh. saying, and the whole nine. And, and I used to take records, and I used to put it on the record player. And as the record player is playing, I would play along with the record. So that's how I got good on learning how to play, you know, songs on my own. So, so I started off with the with, with the organ. Then when I got in the sixth grade, Vlad, then I took up drum lessons, hmm. and I started learning how to read the drum music and everything. But after a while, it got a little complicating. So I just started mimicking whatever I heard on the drums for our drum parts and stuff. And everybody else was reading music except me. But I was playing my parts exactly right, the way that they were playing it as they were reading the music. You know what I'm saying? And then um, when I got into seventh grade, took up the trombone, and I started reading the music on that. And then next thing you know, that became complicating. So I started mimicking everything that all, all my horn parts and everything, you know what I'm saying? And I started just playing all of that stuff on my own. And then I started messing with the saxophone. Started picking that up. Started messing with the xylophone. You know what I'm saying? And started picking that up. Then I started messing with the trumpets. I started picking that up. Then, uh, I remember standing up on the chair and playing the oboe. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? And I start and I start picking that up. And then, you know, I was always good, you know, with percussion instruments, you know, the big kettle drum, the boom, that drum. Yeah, I started playing that. Uh, also I was picked up the violin, start playing the violins and stuff and the and the cellos and uh, French horns. So, man, I play a lot of that stuff today, timbales, congas, a lot of the percussion instruments, cowbells. Yeah, I do a lot, I play a lot. But I learned a lot of it on my own. But I ain't gonna say that, that I learned it on my own, I say that that's God teaching me. You know what I'm saying? Because he gave me the power to be able to do all of that stuff. And if, you know what I'm saying, so. Every moment we live is controlled by God. The only thing he lets us control is our personal actions. And at the end of the day, that's how he judges us, but can't nobody else judge us. So that's how I got to play them 14 different instruments right now today, Vlad. Sorry for the long answer, but I'm not gonna give you nothing in half. You're getting the whole (laughs) shit, nothing but the whole shit. So help the whole shit, y'all. So time goes on. You end up having a radio show and Chuck D has a radio show as well. Right, right, right. right. And Back the two of you, days. the two of you end up linking up. Um, um, well, let me say this. Before we had our radio show, before we had our radio show, we were a mobile disc jockey group called Spectrum City. Right. And when I first met Chuck D and Hank Shockley and Keith Shockley, I was with my boy Son of Berserk. And Son of Berserk, uh, was part of a group called the Townhouse Three, which was a rap group under the wing of Chuck and Hank and Keith. And one day, Son of Berserk wanted me to play some keyboards on his track that they were making for the radio show. So he took me up to the studio. And back in the days, Vlad, we used to play the dozens. I mean, Dozens was real big back in the days, and I used to always be one of the best. Couldn't nobody take me down. (laughs) So I get up to the studio, play the keyboards on this record. Next thing you know, Chuck and Hank starts going all out on me, talking about my moms, talking about the big hole that I had in my couch at the crib, all of that. So I started playing Dozens back, man. I, I was taking them down by myself. I mean, I was a, uh, I, I, I was, a, I was an unbelievable force when it came down to the telling jokes and all that. You know what I'm saying? Next thing you know, Chuck and Hank and Keith, yeah, they kind of fell in love with the guy. So I start hanging out with them, 
and I became part of their group, Spectrum City. And we had a friend named Bill Stephanie who was going to Adelphi University, and Bill Stephanie had a radio show on WBAU 90.3 FM at Adelphi, and he happened to get Chuck, Keith, and Hank on the radio for the Spectrum City Mix Hour and One Half. So as we were doing this radio show, and they was like, yo, Flay, we need to get you a radio show. We need to put you on the radio. So next thing you know, I ended up having the MC DJ Flavor Show on 90.3 FM WBAU. And I and my show would come on Saturday nights from from uh from ten to eleven. I'll never forget it. And when my show came on, Vlad, I mean, what I was doing was playing, you know, um, I would go around the neighborhood and I would collect CDs and tapes from people. As long as it didn't have no cursing in it, Vlad, then I would play, play it on my show. You know what I'm saying? In the whole nine. My show started becoming so popular on a Saturday night, Vlad, I was knocking out 98.7 Kiss. I was knocking out WBLS. I was killing Hot 97, you know, for that one hour. You know what I'm saying? For real. And then um, um, during our radio shows, Vlad, up at BAU, we used to have all of the guys come through, LL Cool J, the Beasties. Um, a matter of a fact, also, back in the days, we gave the Fat Boys one of their first radio interviews. Hmm. Right there at BAU. You know what I'm saying? In the whole nine. But everybody was coming up through the station. So then, um, one day, I'm going to tell you this story. I got to tell you this story. Okay? So one day, I was on my way up to the studio. And this guy named Ron D. Whaley. He says, yo, man, what's up with your boy Chuck D, man? I want to battle him. I said, well, yo, Chuck D, man, we don't be battling. His name was Chuck E. D. at the time, not Chuck D, but Chuck E. D. I'm like, yo, Chuck E. D., man, we don't battle. If anything, we'll, we'll, we'll let you battle somebody. We'll put on the gig and everything and put you out there, the whole nine, and the whole shit. So when I got to the studio, finally got to the studio, I hear something going, so I'm like, what the fuck is Chuck doing in here, man? Yo, Vlad, I walked in the studio, Vlad. Let me find out that Chuck D had a cassette tape, the, the, the tape coming out of the cassette deck going around a microphone stand and right back into the cassette deck. That was the first loop, ladies and gentlemen. Yes. So I told Chuck D, so I told my partner Chuck D, I said, yo, man, this guy Ron D. Welly, man, yo, he wants to battle you, man. You know what I'm saying? The whole nine. And he said that, he, he, that, that you swear you nice, Chuck. But I said, yo, Chuck, yo, G., you know what I'm saying? I told Ron D. I said, yo, my boy don't swear he nice. He knows he's nice. So Chucks was like, yo, put that story on the beginning of this tape right now. Put it on the beginning of this tape. So then that's when I said, yo, Chuck, I was on my way up here to the studio, man. You know what I'm saying? And this brother stopped me and asked me, yo, what's up with your brother Chucky D? He swear he nice. I said, yo, the brother don't swear he nice. He knows he's nice. You know what I'm saying? So, Chuck, I got a feeling you turning into a public enemy, man. Now, remember that line you was kicking to me on the way out to L.A., Laurelton, Queens, when we was in the car on our way to the shop? But, yo, right now, kick the bass for them brothers and let them know what goes on. Chuck D said, what goes on? Well, come on in, put it up on the board. Another rapper shot down from the mouth that roared. Beginning of public enemy number one, Vlad. So like I was telling you, how all of the guys used to come by the station and everything, you know what I'm saying? One night, 
DMC and Jam Master J came up to WBAU. And Jay was like, yo, where's your man Chuck, man? We want to talk to Chuck. You know what I'm saying? In the whole nine. So I took them over to the studio. And it was Jam Master J that talked Chuck into putting Public Enemy Number 1 out on Def Jam Records. You know what I'm saying? Let me tell you yeah. something. At that time, yo, Rick Rubin and Russell Simmons, they didn't want me. Now I check heard. this out. Back in the days, you know, Vlad, the the the, 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 the MC style and the texture with that real deep bassy voice. Oh, 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 oh. It's like a jungle sometimes. It makes me wonder how I keep from going under. Oh, 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 oh. You know, it was real bassy. But my voice was real high, it was real peaky, it was real annoying. Motherfuckers was hating that shit for real, G. So, 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 Rick Rubin and them said, well, listen, we don't want him. We just want you. Mm -hmm. Chuck was like, well, look, the record is not going to work without him, man. So Chuck D is the one that forced me down Def Jam's throat. Yep. And when he did that, the next thing you know, when I came out with, yeah, boy, everybody started sampling that shit. Everybody started sampling that shit. And also, um, when I said, rock that shit, homie, people started sampling that. The next thing you know, I became the most sampled voice right now to this day as we speak in the history of music. Nobody else's voice has been sampled more than mine's. And I guarantee you right now, Russell Simmons and Leo Cohen, yeah, I bet you they glad they signed me then. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, so you guys signed a Def Jam. Yeah. You come out with Yo Bum Rush the Show. Yeah. And it ends up being Def Jam's lowest selling album to that date. Yeah, I mean, I mean, well, 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 the reason why it probably didn't sell high is because, you know, we were brand new, brand new on the mm -hmm. block. A lot of people didn't understand us and where we were coming from. You know what I'm saying? And um, I'll never forget the day, Vlad, when I used to sit around the radio with my tape recorder waiting for us to come on so I could tape that shit. You know what I'm saying? And one night, Mr. Magic was playing Public Enemy Number 1 on the radio. And I'm like, oh, man. Oh, this is dope, man. I'm, I'm, I'm really hearing me on the radio. This is crazy. Then going towards the end of the record, Mr. Magic says, we don't know who these guys are, but I guarantee you we will have no more music by the suckers. Uh, he was dissing us, G. I'm like, oh, come on, man. I'm a big fan of Magic, too. And I'm like, how the fuck he gonna diss us and shit? You know what I'm saying? The whole shit. So I said, okay. I'm gonna diss this motherfucker back. God bless Mr. Magic. I know you rested in peace now. And we did become good friends before he passed away. But anyway, I always say thank you, Mr. Magic, for a great record. I said, yeah, I'm going to dish your ass back. So I took his voice and I sampled that shit. And I put that shit on the beginning of cold lamping with flavor. So, well, the first album comes out. And okay. like I said, it doesn't do huge numbers. I know I took you kind of far. But then, okay. well, but then Nation of Millions comes out and it just goes ballistic. When you guys made Nation of Millions, did you knew did you know what you had on your hands at that point? Honestly, not really. Cause all we were doing was just making records and shit, man. And you know, we knew that we was making some of the hottest records around. You know what I'm saying? In the whole nine. Um Honestly, I didn't know that it would be as big as it did get. And I ain't gonna lie, but I never really thought about it. The only thing I did was just make the records and be part of it. Well, I mean, that is such a, an all-time classic. 
Thank you. Classic album. Uh, and I remember uh, Night, of, Night of the Living Bassheads was such a creative, unbelievable video. Yeah. When we did make that video, we used real people that was really actually getting high. Okay. You know what I'm saying? And not only that, but we had to get them high for the video. <laughs> to give it that real, that real feel, that real look. You know what I'm saying? To give you reality. That's what we was about. Just giving giving you reality, but on records. Well, you actually had a drug problem during the time I that sure that video did. was made. Was it a little strange doing an anti-crack song like Night of the Living Bassheads and actually behind closed doors you were actually on drugs yourself? Um, honestly, to tell you the truth, I didn't have no guilty feeling about it because I ain't going to lie. Around that time, yeah, man, I was going like 180 miles an hour, man, with that drug shit, with that coke and crack shit. You know what I'm saying? That was one of the worstest mistakes that I could have really ever made with them, with my life. You know what I'm saying? Experimenting with drugs and shit. Let me tell you something, man. Drugs, them shits is real easy to get on and they're hard as hell to get off. You know what I'm saying? And if I would have known that back in those days, then... I might, I don't think I would have experienced, I don't think I would have experimented with it. Um, I got to the point, I got to the point, Vlad, where I was spending like twenty-three dollars to $2,500 per day on coke and crack, per day. And I did that shit for six years straight, do the math. It's a lot of money, bro. And I ain't yeah. going to lie, but um, I thank God. I thank God that I'm still living today and be able to tell about it. Because now I could teach about it. You know, I could teach about the mistakes that I made. And hopefully people won't make the same mistakes now and everything, you know. And I, I, I had a lot of people around me that were supposed to be my friends, but yet. You know, when I go to the bathroom or something, they would steal my shit, and I would come back, and my pile is, like, smaller. You know what I'm saying? I thank God for those thieving-ass friends that I had because if it wasn't for them stealing my shit, maybe those could have been the hits that took me out. You know what I'm saying? So... I did learn a lot from going through that. You know what I'm saying? And it was a nightmare. You know what I'm saying? I mean, being on drugs, it took me away from my family. It had me it had me to where I was late for all of my gigs. You know what I'm saying? It doesn't give a fuck about you. That's one thing I can say about drugs. Drugs don't give a fuck about you, Holmes. You know what I'm saying? For real. You know what I'm saying? And drugs is like a robot that we built to, you know, and, and we're supposed to be in control of this robot. But when the robot starts smacking you around, telling you what to fucking do, it's time to either destroy the robot or either reprogram it. And that's one thing that I didn't do. I didn't try to reprogram it. I didn't try to destroy it. I just let it do what it did to me. You know what I'm saying? And... And, and, and if anybody asks me to this day, would I want to do all of that over to not be on drugs? I tell them no. And the reason why is because it, 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 it gave me a big lesson in life. Not only that, but it also helped me to make me who I am today. You know, and I, and the person that I am today, I wouldn't, want to do anything over you know because I'm full of knowledge today I'm full I'm wise and I can I can teach a lot now so a lot of that stuff that I went through on drugs right now being that I'm clean today you know what I'm saying and I feel real good to be clean from that shit you know what I'm saying I mean now there's times I be around people they sniffing coke and doing this shit and doing that don't bother me 
You know what I'm saying? But I'm not stupid enough to stay around it. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Because I was fucked up off of that shit for 18 years. So that means you're going through a dark ass tunnel for 18 years. Now, in order for you to get out of that tunnel, you got to turn around and come back 18 years. Mm. The same distance that it takes you to go there, it's going to take you that same amount of time for you to get back. You know what I'm saying? So now I've been clean off of coke and crack now for about a good eight, eight and a half years. I still got another 10 to go before I could be back to where I was. So right now, to this day, yes, addiction can still set into me. So that's why I'm smart enough not to fuck with that shit. Well, you guys dropped uh, Nation of Millions, and it was it was huge. But then when Fear of a Black Planet came out, I felt like Public Enemy was the biggest group in the world at that time. Is that is that a fair assessment? Yes, yeah, fair. And and the thing that kind of held it back, we could have still been a lot bigger and a, and a lot more ahead of ourselves, but by me being on drugs kind of kind of held us back a little bit too. You know what I'm saying? And the whole nine. Um I ain't going to lie by me being on drugs it helped because Chuck D and Professor Griff and all of them is supposed to be anti-drugs, anti-smoking and all of this shit. But I'm the only one in the group that smoked, that drank, that partied. You know what I'm saying? Even though there were other members doing that shit too. I'm just not calling no names and I ain't trying to be a snitch or whatever. But everybody is not real. That's all I got to say. You got real Muslims and you got fake ones. And in my group, there was a few fake ones. Just to let you know, everybody wasn't real Muslim. Fear of a Black Planet comes out, and 911's a joke is one of the big songs on there. And that's a solo song by Flavor Flav. What I didn't realize until I started researching is that the concept of that song was based on an actual 911 situation where someone died. Yeah. Let's yeah. And um, <clears throat> back in the days, you know, I used to, you know, I was in gangs. And shit, you know what I'm saying? And the whole nine and uh we had a gang fight up at my high school, at my junior high school, Dodd Junior High School in Freeport. So one of my friends got stabbed in his side and his lung got punctured. So we called 911. And back in those days, 911 was like a brand new system, and they supposed to show up and but so many minutes, you know what I'm saying, like nine minutes or some shit like that. So we called 911, and it took them about maybe 25, 30 minutes to come. By the time that 911 got there, the guy slipped into a coma. So that when they put him in the ambulance and they was trying to work on him, on his way to the hospital, he died. So that's when I came up with the part of um uh wait um that's when I came up with the part about the autopsies autopsy ambulance. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? In the whole night I said, um they come with the, ah, you got me right now. Wait, I dialed 911 a long time ago. So don't you see how late they reacting? They only come and they come when they want to. So get the morgue truck and then bomb the gonna. They don't care because they stay paid anyway. They treat you like an ace. They can't beat the tray. A no use number with no use people. If, you, if your life is on the line, then you're dead today. Late comers with the late coming stretcher. That's a body bag in disguise, y'all. I'll bet you. I call them body snatchers because they come to fetch you with an autopsy ambulance just to dissect you. Yeah, like that, like that. So, you know, that's what made me, that's what inspired me to write that part, you know? Because cause back in the days that, uh, um, 
Uh, malpractice shit was was real big then. A lot of malpractice was going on. You know what I'm saying in the whole nine. So, so I put that together with the with them coming late. You know what I'm saying. So that's why I said instead of it being a stretcher, that's a body bag in disguise. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it says a lot about how much care is taken towards the black community versus the white community. You know. Yeah, and you know what? Thirty seconds. And, and honestly, it didn't have anything to do with color when I wrote it because, I mean. I mean, there was a quicker response to the white communities than the black communities. But still in all, white communities were still getting late responses too. You know what I'm saying? So it wasn't just a black thing. You know what I'm saying? It was a everybody thing. Well, on that same album was Fight the Power. Mm-hmm. Which is just, I just believe it's just the anthem for, for civil unrest. Mm -hmm. Period. That, that's just as important today as as it was when you guys made it, and it was the soundtrack to Spike Lee's first big movie. Um, you know, and, and in that song, uh, there was the whole Elvis line. That was the first time anyone actually spoke out against Elvis. You know, Elvis yeah. was a hero to most, but to me, he's a straight out racist. The sucker was simple and plain. And then you came in and said, "Motherfuck him and John Wayne." Now, see, let me tell you something about my partner, Chuck D. And I commend Chuck on this. Before Chuck writes something to put it out, he always does some type of research on it first to make sure that he knows what the fuck he's talking about. That's why a lot of our songs that we've made, and this is why I always say that I, I'll, I back Chuck up 189.9 per 9%. Not saying he's perfect, but he's right about a lot, a lot of shit. So a lot of these records that he wrote was based off of actual information. You know, you know, true, actual true information. You know what I'm saying? So when he wrote Fight the Power and he wrote that song about Elvis and John Wayne, he did research on it first before he wrote it, and he found out that they were racist people. You know what I'm saying? John Wayne was a racist. He didn't really like black people. Neither did John, neither did Elvis. I remember back in the days, one of the most famous lines that Elvis was have, have supposedly said, which I never heard it with my ears, but he said, all black people could do is shine my shoes and buy my records. Wow. You know, now that's some racist shit right there. You know yeah. what I'm saying? So that's why I said, yeah, your, your blue suede shoes, don't step on your blue suede shoes. Yeah, bring your shoes over here. I won't step on your blue suede shoes. I shit on your blue suede shoes. Right. And you got to really understand because, you know, some time has passed and today's generation doesn't understand how big Elvis was during that time. Man, he, he was, was big. Elvis was like the Michael Jackson to white, I mean, to white people, basically. That's he right. He was as big as Michael Jackson. People loved him. People thought he was still alive. That's like, right. They, they worshipped this guy. And you guys were the first ones to say, basically, fuck Elvis. Yeah. And we wasn't afraid to say it either. <laughs> right. And to this day, still ain't afraid to say it. Uh, around the time, though, that Black Planet came out, that's when some problems start happening within the group. Professor Griff did the interview where he said that most of the wickedness in the world came from Jews. He was kicked out of the group, brought into the group, kicked out of the group again. You know, then there was the line, and I think Welcome to the Terror Dome, where Chuck D said, so-called chosen, frozen, apology made to whoever pleases till they got me like Jesus. How much of that, you know, you know, you know, some of that content that some people viewed as anti-Semitic, how did that really affect the group? Um, well, honestly, it really didn't affect us too much because nothing was really able to stop us. You know what I'm saying? In the whole nine, um, the only one in our group that really went off the deep end with the anti-Semitic shit and all of that was Professor Griff. You know what I'm saying? Because he made some anti-Semitic 
remark about Jews. And when he made that remark, Vlad, boy, did they have Public Enemies records sitting up on the shelves not being released for a while. And they was like, until we get an apology, we will not fucking sell your records. And the whole shit. The next thing you know, Chuck D came up with this, the decision of, hey, we just going to have to get rid of Griff so we could keep going because it was Griff right now that was stopping the whole show. But that remark that he made about the Jews, you know what I'm saying, in the whole nine. So um, we we ended up letting Professor Griff go for a while. And that really put us back in the game so that way we could continue to, to tour and make more music and sell more records. You know, at the time when Fear of a Black Planet came out, I felt that was, like I said, Public Enemy was at its height and you guys were the hottest group Period, because when you you know you factor in the controversy and everything else like that, it, it made an energy around Public Enemy so huge. And at the same time, you had gangster rap that was very difficult, almost the antithesis of Public Enemy to a certain degree. You know, on a surface level, even though I think down below you guys are really doing the same thing. You know, talking about oppression and fighting against it in your own way. How did you feel about what you guys were doing versus gangster rap at that time? Well, let me say this. Um, one thing about Public Enemy and our music, we always wrote about problems that, were, that was going on in the neighborhood, but at the same time, within the same record, we try to come up with the solution. Mm. You know what I'm saying? And also, you know, our, our records really had messages in them. You know what I'm saying? And, and, and a lot of people, to this day, come up to me and say, Flav, thank you for your music. It has changed my life. Flav, my life was real fucked up until I started listening to any of y'all, man, and I started listening to you guys. And look, man, right now I'm back with my family, this and that, that and this. So, you know, so, so gangster rap was nothing but gangsters writing how they live, you know what I'm saying, in the whole nine. You did have a lot of fucking fake gangsters out there, too. I ain't going to lie. Cause there's a lot of motherfuckers talking about they sh they'll shoot you this or they shot that, holding the guys that never held a gun in their fucking life. You know what I'm saying? I know who some of the fake ones is out there, but I know who the real ones are, too. You know what I'm saying? Real motherfucking gangsters like Easy e and Ice Cube and Dre and... Ice T, you know, real fucking gangsters, you know, that really lived that gangster life, you know what I'm saying, in the whole nine. Um, gangster rap was more loose, you know, Public Enemy's messages in the records was more tight. Like, you know what I'm trying to say, in the whole nine. And when we stopped making records for a while, Public Enemy, when we stopped making records for a while, then nobody really had anybody else to listen to, you know, far yeah. as, you know, message-wise, you know what yeah. I'm saying? And that's when gangster rap really took over, and it became real strong, you know what I'm yeah. saying? And to this day, it's a phenomenon. Yeah, I mean, NWA came in and... And that whole train is still going to this day. You know, Death Row came in and Tupac came in and Snoop came in and it was, yeah, it was over. Yeah. And you're right. No one no one really took the reins. No one really got back on the train that, that Public Enemy started and really right. had been like the biggest group in the world talking about conscious music. You know, J-Rock does it. I mean, sorry, J. Cole does it somewhat. Kendrick does it somewhat. Mm -hmm. But... I think the absolute focus that you guys had on just social injustice, I don't think anyone's done it since. Yeah, not I haven't heard too many too many groups. Um I haven't had too I haven't heard too many rap groups today do what we've done or you know or put out the type of music or or messages that we put out. You know what I'm saying and I'm um um, there was only one other group that 
was coming close to what we were doing. And that's a group called X Clan. Yeah. You know, the red, the black, the green with the keys, sissy. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, you know, that yeah. group right there was was more of um uh, 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 of 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 awareness. You know, it was right yeah. there. Awareness records and stuff, you know. Yeah. Um, but but they never got on the level, the platinum, multi platinum level of a public enemy, unfortunately. Yeah, because Chuck D. <laughs> Chuck I ain't D. gonna lie, man. Yeah, he's and a flavor fucking, flavor. He's a fucking <laughs> genius, man. I I gotta tell you, man, and the way that that we wrote our records, nobody else was doing it like that. You know what I'm saying? And the whole shit. But Chuck, man, hey, he has a college degree, man. You know what I'm saying? And I remember when we first wrote our first album, Yo Bum Rush the Show, me and Chuck D was working for his father, Mr. Ridenhauer. And we we had a job um delivering furniture for interior designers and decorators. And Chuck D's father had that company. We wrote that first album out of a U-Haul truck. Mm. Yo Bum Rush the Show was written out of a U-Haul. Amazing. Yeah. Well, in 1993, you had a an incident where you shot at your neighbor. Uh-huh. And you were charged with attempted murder. Drugs. <laughs> drugs. Going back to drugs, yeah. So you actually pulled out a gun and started shooting at your neighbor. Hey, check this out. One thing about me, and this is a reason. This is a reason why right now that I don't carry a gun today, is because I'm a very cocky motherfucker with a gun. I will fucking dare you to do it, so I can have a reason to fucking shoot your ass. You know what I'm saying? And the whole shit. And yeah, that morning that I had that incident with my neighbor. Um, I had my 380 on me, and and when I got down into my hallway, down into the lobby, and I seen the guy, he kind of lunged at me, so I pulled out my gun. I was like, yo, man, if you in front of my gun, by the time I count to three, I'll fucking shoot you. I'm gonna fucking shoot you. I said, one, he was still standing there. I said, two, he was still standing there. I said, three, pow, he was gone. <laughs> he was gone and shit, you know what I'm saying? So, so then I ran back upstairs, put the gun up, came back down. And when I came back down, there was so many policemen in that lobby. And every, all the policemen drew out their guns. I ain't gonna lie, if there was one shot from a policeman, they probably would have shot each other. That's how many guns that was in, in the lobby that, that morning, man. I'll never forget that. And they made me lay down on the floor and all that, put handcuffs on me and everything, took me to the station, booked me in the whole nine. Then when they got me over to the NIC building, and I see, that's the name of the building that they had me in on Rikers. All of the CEOs over there, they was my fans. It was my right. fans. And at the time, I had a radio show going on on Hot 97 called Flavor Flav's Home Jams. And what I was doing was that thing that I was doing at BAU, going around collecting people's tapes, CDs, long as it ain't had no cursing in it, I would play it on the radio. I was doing the same thing at Hot 97. And Big Dennis Rivera was my engineer. There were times when I used to call into my radio show from home because I was so fucked up, I couldn't make it to the station, Vlad. I couldn't even make it down there, you know what I'm saying? So there was times I used to call in, I used to do my dedications on the phone. So when I got locked up, and I went to jail. They had gave me, I, I had cell four. I had the fourth cell and shit, which was right near the phones. And when it, when, when it was time for my show to come on, 
The CEO would let me come out my cell, let me call into the station, the big dentist, and I'm acting like I'm home. But yet I was locked up. Mm. And here I am. I get on the phone, do my dedications, Vlad. Then after that, then I run back to my cell, lock in, put on, put on the headphones to listen to the radio, to, to the radio show and everything. I don't know nobody else in the history of radio that ever done their radio show from a fucking jail cell, G. Flav did that <laughs> shit. Yeah, G, I did radio from a jail cell. A lot of, hey, it's hard to believe, but nobody else did it. I'm always known to be the first to do some shit. Well, you know, we've all gotten traffic tickets over time. Yes. But you have 78 traffic convictions. Yes. Which ended up getting you a permanent driving ban. Is that Not, correct? Nah, nope. It didn't give me a permanent driving ban. They took all of that stuff, ran it into concurrent, and they gave me a year on Rikers Island in the C-76 building. So I had to go, I had to do a full straight eight months there. Mm. That was my sentence for all of those driving suspensions that I had and everything, you know. But I wasn't banned. It wasn't a ban. It was just that they took all of that stuff and ran it into concurrent, and, and they gave me a felony for it. I mean, how did it feel to go from a superstar, biggest artist in the world, touring, you know, doing shows with 100,000 people, and now you're sitting in a cage in Rikers Island? Like, damn. I, I went from that to this. Um, I ain't gonna lie, but 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 um the feeling is a whole lot different when you can't go nowhere. You you're not under your own power, you know what I'm saying? And you got people telling you what to do with your life, telling you when to go to bed, telling you when you can wake up, telling you when you could go eat, telling you when you could go and breathe some fresh air. And shit, you know what I'm saying? Opposed to just being out and going anywhere you want, doing anything you want, having that freedom. Oh man, let me tell you something. That's one thing that I tell everybody when they're out there hustling and and doing their thing, man, in the streets and everything. I just tell them these two things: stay alive and keep your freedom. And everything else will follow. And maybe hopefully one day you'll be able to get up on your feet to where you don't have to hustle anymore and you can be legit. But the only way you can be legit and to find that out is to be out on the street. You can't do it while you're locked up. You know what I'm saying? Because you only have certain limitations when you're locked up. And when you're locked up, yeah, your ass is limited for real. Like so I was. in 2003. I, I, I ain't going to lie. I was limited in jail. But then again, I was kind of unlimited. And that's because of who I, I was. And like I said, all the CEOs in jail, those were my fans. So there were times, man, when I used to walk around jail without a pass and shit. You know what I'm saying? And I used to go and visit other dorms on my own. And then there was one time, man, when I was... Late getting back to my dorm, they shut the whole jail down looking for me. Mm. When I was right down there, you know, in, in another dorm talking to one of the CEOs and shit. You know what I'm saying? I had mad freedom in jail, man. I had I had all the jobs and shit. I worked in the kitchen. <laughs> I worked on the fucking um, clothes cart. The laundry cart and shit. I worked at the intake to where people come in. And I would take their clothes and give them jail clothes and shit. And if you get smart with me, then I'll fucking give your ass a big ass pair of pants on purpose. And that's what the snitches used to wear. Mm. Big pants. So if you see somebody with big giant pants, shit that don't fit them, that means they're a snitch and shit. You know what I'm saying? And people come through the intake, man, trying to get small with me. I'll give them a big pants on purpose. And then when they go and wearing that shit through jail, they get their ass beat. <laughs> all, the snitch, all the snitches used to get beat up. 
Well, at one point, the group was kind of put on hold. It was on a hiatus. So you guys weren't really touring. You weren't putting out any albums. And I guess right around the middle of 2003, all you had was $142 to your name and a cell phone. And MC Hammer convinced you to join the surreal life and do reality TV. Yeah, yeah, it wasn't something like that. It wasn't something like that. Um, you know, um, I had, um, I got a friend, her name is Sherry, and she works over at E1. And um, one day she took me over to the VH1 offices. And when she took me over there, I made such an impact because I was going to everybody's cubicle, fucking with everybody. Hey, how you doing? Yo, I'm playing. Yo, what's up? Ah! You know what I'm saying? I mean, I went to everybody's cubicle, man. You know what I'm saying? Everybody was shocked to see me there and everything. The word got around that I was in the building. The next thing you know, I'm getting a, I'm getting a call from Chris Abrego and Mark Cronin who were the executive producers of Surreal Life. And they called me in, go with my friend Sherry, over to the VH1 offices and everything, and went to everybody's cubicle. Done made a big con a big impact on everybody over at the VH1 offices. And when the word got around that I was there, like I said, then I got a call from Mark Cronin and Chris Abrego, who was the executive producers of Surreal Life. So they said to me, yo, Flav, have you ever um, seen The Surreal Life? I said, I heard about it, and I know that that, so that, that show was supposed to be for has-beens. I'm not a has-been. They said, well, we want to put you on the show. So I'm like, well, I seen Hammer on there. I seen Vanilla Ice on there. And, you know, at that time, they were considering Vanilla Ice and Ham has -beens. You know what I'm saying? Even though they were still kind of hot in the game anyway. My boys don't never get cold. You know what I'm saying? So I said, all right, let me, let me speak to Hammer, man, and, and, and see what his intake is on this. So I called Hammer. I said, yo, Hammer, man, you think I should do this do this TV show, man? It's a real life shit. And he was like, look, man, I think you should really do it because good things has happened to me after the show, and it can happen, this, happen for you the same way, Flay. I said, okay, Hammer, cool. Hung up the phone, told Mark Cronin, Chris Abrego. I said, all right, I'll do it. I'm in. So they put me on the show, Vlad. And when they put me on that show, Surreal Life 3, that show became number one that year. And I didn't know nobody in the house either, you know. The only person I knew was Charo. Because when I walked in the house, I seen this lady. And I'm like, oh, I know you, I know you, I know you. Oh, I love you. Who are you? Oh, she's... Then I'm like, wow, that lady from the love boat. Charo, coochie, coochie, coochie. She says, yep, that's me. So next thing you know, uh, this fat guy comes in, chubby guy and shit. He's all slow. I'm like, I know this guy. I can't place his face. I mean, I can't place his name, but I know this guy. I know this guy. And who was it? It happened to be Jordan Knight lead singer from New Kids on the Block. So I knew who he was, it's just that his appearance changed because he had gained so much weight and I haven't seen him, you know, in, in so many years. Then this other girl comes in, I ain't know who the fuck she was. I heard she got booted off American Idol. Her name happened to be Ryan Starr. Then this tall lady, man comes in the house flat and I looked at her and I'm like oh oh shoot I know you I know you I seen you in a movie I seen you in a movie this and that that and this 
little did I know that was the world's famous Bridget Nielsen. Then this other guy comes in, last but not least, and I didn't really know who he was too much because I didn't really watch Full House that much, but that happened to be Dave Coulier. Me and Dave became good friends too, you know what I'm saying? But that season, I really showed my ass, bro. I said, I'm going, I want to be on TV. I'm going to try to make a TV career out of this. You know what I'm saying? Well, at one point, the group was kind of put on hold. It was on a hiatus. So you guys weren't really touring. You weren't putting out any albums. And I guess right around the middle of 2003, all you had was $142 to your name and a cell phone. And MC Hammer convinced you to join the surreal life and do reality TV. Yeah, yeah, it went something like that. It went something like that. Um, you know, um, I had, um, I got a friend, her name is Sherry, and she works over at E1. And um, one day she took me over to the VH1 offices. And when she took me over there, I made such an impact because I was going to everybody's cubicle, fucking with everybody. Hey, how you doing? Yo, I'm playing. Yo, what's up? Ah! You know what I'm saying? I mean, I went to everybody's cubicle, man. You know what I'm saying? Everybody was shocked to see me there and everything. The word got around that I was in the building. The next thing you know, I'm getting a, I'm getting a call from Chris Abrego and Mark Cronin who were the executive producers of Surreal Life. And they called me in, go with my friend Sherry, over to the VH1 offices and everything, and went to everybody's cubicle, done made a big con a big impact on everybody over at the VH1 offices. And when the word got around that I was there, like I said, then I got a call from Mark Cronin and Chris Abrego, who was the executive producers of Surreal Life. So they said to me, yo, Flav, have you ever um, seen The Surreal Life? I said, I heard about it, and I know that that, so, that, that show was supposed to be for has-beens. I'm not a has-been. They said, well, we want to put you on the show. So I'm like, well, I seen Hammer on there. And I seen Vanilla Ice on there. And, you know, at that time, they were considering Vanilla Ice and Hammer has-beens. You know what I'm saying? Even though they were still kind of hot in the game anyway. My boys don't never get cold. You know what I'm saying? So I said, all right, let me let me speak to Hammer, man, and, and, and see what his intake is on this. So I called Hammer. I said, yo, Hammer, man, you think I should do this, do this TV show, man? It's a real life shit. And he was like, look, man. I think you should really do it because good things has happened to me after the show and it can happen this happen for you the same way, Flav. I said, okay, Hammer, cool. Hung up the phone, told Mark Cronin, Chris Abrego. I said, all right, I'll do it. I'm in. So they put me on the show, Vlad. And when they put me on that show, Surreal Life 3, that show became number one that year. And I didn't know nobody in the house either, you know. The only person I knew was Charo. Because when I walked in the house, I seen this lady. And I'm like, oh, I know you, I know you, I know you. Oh, I love you. Who are you? Oh, she's... Then I'm like, wow, that lady from the love boat. Charo, coochie, coochie, coochie. She says, yep, that's me. So next thing you know, uh, this fat guy comes in, chubby guy and shit. He was all slow. I'm like, I know this guy. I can't place his face. I mean, I can't place his name, but I know this guy. I know this guy. And who was it? It happened to be Jordan Knight lead singer from New Kids on the Block. 
So I knew who he was. It's just that his appearance changed because he had gained so much weight and I haven't seen him, you know, in, in so many years. Then this other girl comes in. I ain't know who the fuck she was. I heard she got booted off American Idol. Her name happened to be Ryan Starr. Then this tall lady, man, comes in the house, Vlad, and I looked at her, and I'm like, oh, oh, shoot, I know you. I know you. I've seen you in a movie. I've seen you in a movie, this and that, that and this. Little did I know that was the world's famous Bridget Nielsen. Then this other guy comes in, last but not least, and I didn't really know who he was too much because I didn't really watch Full House that much, but that happened to be Dave Coulier. Me and Dave became good friends too, you know what I'm saying? But that season, I really showed my ass, bro. I said, I'm going, I want to be on TV. I'm going to try to make a TV career out of this. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> well, I remember, you know, you're so big on the props. Uh, I remember on the show you had the Viking hat. Yeah. What 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 led up to the Viking hat? What made you pick well, up that Well, I was hat down so uh, we this? we public enemy, we had a gig in Philadelphia. And um I used to always go out and get props for my show. Cuz I'm the only one in the show that goes and changes and shit and come back out and all different kinds of shit. Chuck and everybody else, they just stay the same. You know what I'm saying? So I had got this Viking helmet that I seen and also an Indian headdress, an Indian war warrior chief headdress and everything. You know what I'm saying? Um, the Indian warrior headdress, Vlad, that's what I wore for the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. We wasn't inducted yet, but we had to play there. And when I wore that headdress in Cleveland, I got so much flack because the Indians, they felt, they felt like they were being picked on or some shit. You know what I'm saying? But little did they know, Flavor Flav is a Native American too. I have Indian blood in me, and my family comes from the Shinnecock Reservation, Eastern Long Island. And so does LL Cool J's family. They come from the Shinnecock Reservation, Eastern Long Island. My father's mother was Estelle Maud Smith. Also, LL Cool J's last name is Smith. I got a feeling LL might be my cousin, just to let you guys know. And I tell everybody this. You know what I'm saying? I hope I'm not taking you too far or whatever. Nah. You know? Okay, so so that's where the, the Viking helmet came from. Yeah, the Viking I... helmet came from me being in Philly and me just getting props for my shows, you know, for the Public Enemy shows. I used to wear that stuff on the stage. So next thing you know, I just started wearing the shit on TV and it became part of me. No, well, I'm you're saying. still rocking the the clock. I sure but, and that came way before. Yes. Uh, how did who who the, gave you the idea to put a giant clock? Um, you? well, back in the days, Vlad, we used to wear stopwatches as a fad. That was the fad, you know. It was the style. One day, this crackhead came through our projects, and we were playing the dozens. And me and my, and my boy, son of Berserk, Tony Allen. He took the stopwatch off of my neck and put the clock around my neck. Everybody started laughing. Ah, ha, 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 ha. Okay, it was funny. They dared me to wear this clock during a show. Now, back in them days, if you did Flavor Flav to do something, I would do it. So they dared me to wear this clock during a show. So when we went and opened up for the Beastie Boys in Passaic, New Jersey... I wore the clock during the show. When we got the newspaper clippings back the next day, we were on the front page of Daily News and Newsday, right? 
the look of the clock was dope. So I decided we decided to keep to keep this look. Now also, if you go to the early public enemy pictures, Vlad, you will see Chuck D. Wall clock too. Right, well, Nation of Millions, the the cover, he's wearing a smaller clock. Yeah, yeah. yeah but we used to wearing always wear while. clocks for the show. That was this was a part of our, you know, part of our wardrobe for the show. Then one day Chuck D. he took his clock off, and Hank Shockley is like, Flav, 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 man, you need to take that clock off, man. It's getting old. It's out of date. I'm like, Nah, man. I'm not taking my clock off. I'm keeping my clock. One of the best decisions that I could have made, Vlad. You know what I'm saying? Because this clock became part of my identity. You know what I'm saying? Not only that, but this clock has gotten me into a lot of trouble. But it has also gotten me out of a lot of trouble. You know what I'm saying? There was a time, man, when I was on a, on a, on a Southern State Parkway in New York. I'm in my Corvette, 55 mile an hour zone, and I'm going down the fucking highway, G, doing 163 and shit. You know what I'm saying? I pass the cops. Next thing you know, I look in my rear view mirror and the cops are way, 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 way back there. So I pulled over on the grass to wait for them. And when they got up to my vet, when they finally got up to my vet, man, they got out with the guns drawn and everything. I was like, yo, 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 officer, officer, come on, don't shoot, don't shoot, it's Flavor Flav. They was like, oh, come on, Flav, man, putting their gun back. Come on, man, you're going too fast out here, Flav. Where's your license, Flav? Well, I don't have a license, officer. Come on, Flav. Look, listen, this is what you do. Here, give me your autograph for my daughter. Let's take a picture. And then after that, Flav, I'm going to let you go. But if I see you out here tonight again, Flav, I'm taking your car. Who gets out of shit like that, Vlad? <laughs> Come on now. I'm in a 55-mile-an-hour zone doing 163. If it wasn't for this clock, man, them cops would have shot me or either locked me up, whatever. So this clock has gotten me out of a lot of trouble, too. Well, I've said in the beginning that you're the greatest hip-hop hype man of all time. Uh, if you were to name the other greatest hip-hop hype men, who would they be? Number one, straight out the gate. And I really miss this guy right now. He just passed away. His name is Bushwick Bill. Mm. From the Ghetto yeah. Boys. That's Flavor Flav number two. Yeah. The third Flavor Flav of the rap music business, Busta Rhymes, from Leaders of the New School. Okay, but well, he had a hype man, you know, Spliff Star. But Busta Rhymes was... I call him the flavor flav of the uh, of the rap music business because bust because of my styles, my dress styles that I used to have with the hats and the glasses and the crazy personality and the whole all of that. When Buster Rhymes came out with "Oh my God, Oh my God," mm -hmm. that was that was a flavor effect right there. You know what I'm saying? So that's why I call him the flavor flav number three of the rap industry, you know what I'm saying? Flavor Flav number four was no other than ODB, Old Dirty Bastard. Not only that, but also I learned after his death, that's my cousin, Blood Family. Wow. Yes, we are related through, 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 through my family called the Cuffies. You know what I'm saying? So there's Drayton's, there's Cuffy's, there's Smith's. But yeah, the old dirty bastard was my cousin. And Wu-Tang Clan, Vlad, I have three blood members, three blood family members that are my cousins. That's old dirty bastard, Rizza, and Jizza. 
throw them three of my cousins. You know what I'm saying? In the whole nine. Um, um, the fifth flavor flavor of the rap music industry, Spliff Star from Flip Mode. I haven't seen no other flaves after Spliff Star. <laughs> well, I mean, in terms of hype men, if I were to say the number two hype man, like strictly a hype man in the traditional sense of the word, I would have to say Send Dog. I'm oh, Cypress and Send Dog. That's right, Cypress Hill. My guy, thank you for the pull up. Thank you for the pull up, man. How in the world can I forget about my guy, Send Dog? That's my boy. Yep. That's right, yep. but, but but yeah. And he number was... three, I would say uh, Freaky Ty from The Lost Boys. Okay, Freaky Ty, I, man, I miss Ty Rest too. in peace. Yeah, and, and, and right now, Mr. Cheeks, we're still in contact together today. Love Cheeks, man. You know, when you get to a certain size, people are going, you know, you start not only being in the news, but comedians are going to start speaking about you. Um, I remember uh, Cat Williams did a whole skit where he talked about you. Yeah, that's my guy. And also, you know, me and Cat Williams always been good friends, too. You know what I'm saying? In the whole nine. Um, and he was the host of my roast. Right. Yeah, yeah, he was the host of the VH1, Flavor Flay's VH1 roast. Yeah, he, he hosted that. You know what I'm saying? In the whole nine. Um, and I I heard, I, I haven't seen the skit, but I heard that he did a skit on me. Um, and he was saying, he said something about, um, at the end of the day, all Flav wants is his money or some shit. Right. Well, he, he basically did a whole skit where he said, hey, Flav, how are you going to let these people talk about you and say all these bad things about you? And your response was, I don't care what they say. They got to pay me, boy. <laughs> broke out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it was something like that. Yeah. Well, you had an issue with some of the things that Chris Rock said about you and some jokes. Yeah, and let me tell you something, man. Chris Rock, I've always that's always been my guy. I always loved Chris Rock. You know what I'm saying? And when he um when he started clowning on me, I kinda took offense to it. You know what I'm saying? Not thinking that, hey, this is comedy. I'm thinking, hey, this guy is lashing out at me. You know what I'm saying? But then again, I mean, hey, in order for him to be somebody he has to pick on somebody. So I was the somebody that he had to pick on in order for his ass to be somebody. You know what I'm saying in the whole nine? Um, I remember Chris before, way before New Jack City. Um, I met him through my boy Nelson George. And Nelson George was a writer for Billboard magazine. You know what I'm saying? And also, um, the movie New Jack City, Vlad, um, the part of Pookie, which Chris Rock played, was originally written for me. Really? Yes. And I went out there, auditioned for the part and everything, and they liked me and they were going to use me for the movie. It was Chuck D and Hank Shockley that went behind my back without me knowing it, telling the, telling the producers, no, Flav can't play that part because of what our music stands for, this and that, that, and this. So they ended up giving my part to Chris Rock. Were you upset about that when you heard the news? Uh, after I found out what happened, yeah, I was really upset. You know what I'm saying? And just like um, like my partner, Eddie Murphy, also let you know, Eddie Murphy was in my ninth grade English class in Roosevelt High School. Mm. We had a teacher named Mrs. Muckle. And Eddie Murphy had a movie called Vampire in Brooklyn. Right. 
And the part that Kadeem Hardison played, which was his his assistant, the vampire's assistant, whatever, that part was written for me too. You didn't get that either. And I didn't get that either. And the person that let me know that they gave my part to Kardeem Hardison was Lawrence Fishburne. And I'll never forget it. Because I was with my boy Heavy D. And Heavy Rest D was doing theater. He was doing some theater shit back in the days. And, you know, Heavy was like, come on, Flav. I want to take you with me, man. I want you to meet Lawrence Fishburne. So it was Heavy D that took me to meet Lawrence Fishburne. And it was Lawrence Fishburne that said, yo, Flav, that's fucked up, man. They gave you a part to Kadeem Hardison. I'm like, wow. I'm like, how did you know that? But then again, hey, come on, this is the movie world. You know, and this butt's so big. Well, you know, you mentioned how Chuck D went behind your back. To Him and Hank Shockley went behind my back. And Hank Shockley. And told them yeah. that I couldn't play that part uh, in the movie. And not only that, but they knew that if so happens I would I played that part and I would have took off, it could have been in it could have been the end of public enemy. Go I ahead. mean Chuck D actually had issues with you doing reality TV, right? Yes, he did. At first, um at, at first he didn't. But then when he seen that they were trying to portray me in ways that I shouldn't be portrayed, that's when he started having a problem with it. Well, at one point you actually sued Chuck D over royalties. Um, yeah, because, you know, there was some, some, some songs that I wrote that I didn't get credit for. You know what I'm saying? Like, there's a record that we have called Harder Than You Think. My voice is the meat of that record, but I don't have one writing royalty on that record. You know what I'm saying? Shit like that, you know. Anytime I go after somebody for something, it's for a valid reason. You know what I'm saying? Did that get, did that get worked out eventually? Uh, we're still trying to work out the, the kinks right now, me and Chuck. So Chuck is out on the road with his group, Prophets of Rage, Be Real, Tommy Morella, and these guys are doing their thing. I think they have a uh, a show in L.A. on the 12th, 11th and 12th. So I think I'm going to go to the show. Because I want to go see see what they do live anyway. I want to go see their show. But Chuck D, was, you know, that's still my boy and I love him and everything. You know what I'm saying? It's just this, it's, it's messed up how how money you know what I'm saying, makes you instead of you making the money. It's fucked up how the money makes you, how it makes you do shit, how it makes you split up from your friends, how it splits up, splits you up from your family. You know what I'm saying? That's why people come to me and say, hey, Flav, sign this dollar bill for me. Man, I'm not putting my name on that evil piece of paper. That paper's evil, yo. You know what I mean? You know, people die for it. People get sold for it. People, you know what I'm saying, get robbed for it. No, When it comes down to money and huge amounts of money, nobody's really fair. Everybody wants the most and shit. You know what I'm saying? And the whole shit. So, and, I, I, and I'm quite sure there's a lot of dollar bills that I've signed and people have died with those dollar bills in their pocket. So the, so that's the reason why, Vlad, that I don't put my money, my I don't put my name on money because it's an evil piece of paper, and I feel that God gave me a good name. You know what I'm saying? My name is too good to go on that evil piece of paper. You know what I'm saying? I know that money is something that we can't survive without, though. You know what I'm saying? Just like 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 the average homeless person that's out on the street that got nowhere to go. I got no food to eat. At least a homeless person can walk over to a garbage can, pick a chicken bone out of out the garbage can, at least there's some meat on it, so he's eating something. But it did take money to get that to get that there, you know. It took money to make garbage, right? 
Now check this out. There's only one person in this world, one human being, one living being that I know of that didn't need no money. He survived without no money. He had his own transportation. He killed for his food. Not only that, but he even lucked up and he got a girl. And next thing you know, he ended up getting this girl pregnant. Who is this guy I'm talking about? Now I'm asking you a question on your podcast. Adam. Huh? Adam from Adam and Eve. Nope, it wasn't Adam. Definitely wasn't Adam. <laughs> Can I tell you his name? Go ahead. Tarzan. <laughs> <laughs> hey, come on, man. Tarzan, he had his own transportation, man. The vines through the jungle, traveling around on the elephant's back. You know what I'm saying? He killed for his food in the whole nine. Not only that, but he even lucked up and got a girl. Remember Jane that was out with the hunters? Because Jane uh -huh. was out with the hunters, and she was like, she was experimenting with Tarzan. Yo, man, let me tell you something, man. She decided to stay out there with Tarzan, and she let Tarzan hit that shit one good time. And when she hit, when Tarzan hit that shit and went ape in that, I can curse. Yep. Your pocket. Yo, when Tarzan went ape in the pussy G, yo, man, she was like, whoa, hey, I'm staying right here with my man. Fuck you, hunters. Get the fuck out of here. Next thing you know, Tarzan got her pregnant, and they had boy. Uh, next thing you know, they ended up with a monkey, cheetah, and all that, you know. You know, you know, the rest of the story is history. Y'all know I'm a nut, man. <laughs> It, yeah, I, had, is had, true? I, had, I, had, I had to put some type of humor yeah. on the podcast, man. We, I think we was too serious. So I had to put a joke up in there. So. Is it true that you stole a Long Island Railroad train? I sure did. We used to start the Long Island trains up, Long Island Railroad trains, and we used to ride them down the track. And then once we get down to the reservoir and the track, the train get up to a certain speed, we'll jump off the train and just let that shit go. <laughs> Yeah, but I stole trains. I stole trains. People, people steal cars, but I've never heard of people stealing yeah, trains. Yeah, we stole trains. I used to steal boats, too. Used to go down to the docks. People used to leave their key in the boat, man. I used to untie the boat, man. Turn the motor on. Take people's boats and shit. Go out there. We used to play crash the rules in the boats. All of that shit. Yeah. I've done you a know, lot of stuff, man that a yeah. lot of people wouldn't imagine of me doing or, the, or imagine of them doing. I've done a lot. You know, when, when you have such a big persona and you have such a big image and you've done so much in front of the public and, and you have this image of yourself and, and you kind of have this conflict where you're expressing yourself and you have all these people that love you, but then you have this image that upsets certain people. Like, you know, we talked about how Chuck D has had, you know, issues with you doing certain things, like playing a crackhead in, in New Jack City and so forth. And you have this line between, you know, like Dave Chappelle talked about how he left the Chappelle show because he felt like certain white people were laughing at him as opposed to with him. How do you view that in terms of your image and how... You know, for example, certain black people view you versus the way certain white people view you and so forth. Um, to me, Vlad, to me, I feel that everybody perceives to be the same. You know what I'm saying in the whole nine? You know, um, I mean, it's all, it, it, it's, to, I get equal love from both sides from white side and from black side. You know what I'm saying in the whole nine. So, um, like 2 Chain said, I'm different, yeah, I'm different. I'm different, yeah, I'm different. And the reason why I say that is because I'm not the same as somebody else who, 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 who gets the, um, the straight up racial tension and shit. 
You know what I'm saying? A lot of people respect me more. I don't get too much racial attention. You know what I'm saying? In the whole nine. Um, a lot of people thought that I was racist at one time, but when they meet me and they get with me, they sit and talk with me and they get to fill me out, they end up finding out, hey, this guy doesn't have one racist bone in his body. Not one. You know what I'm saying? And if anything, I'm always trying to bring bring people together. I'm always trying to unite the world. You know what I'm saying? Um, um, when the Beastie Boys first came out, a lot of people, a lot of black people couldn't understand them because they were white boys trying to do some black shit, which is rapping. You know what I'm saying? But rapping has no color. There's no color to rapping, you know what I'm saying? And the whole shit, rapping is for, for who whoever can do it or for whoever likes it. And here I am right now. Uh, here I am out on the stage, public enemy, pro-black, pro-black and all of this shit. And, and I'm the only one out of my group on the stage with the Beastie Boys slipper, slipping and sliding around in a bunch of Budweiser beer and shit on stage. You know, because they had a Budweiser endorsement then you know what i'm saying in the whole shit and uh i used to go out there on that stage chuck and them used to be so fucking mad at me vlad but i was showing the crossover the connection you know what i'm saying just like how run dmc crossed over to aerosmith just like like we crossed over with with anthrax, bring the noise. Well, this crossover that I did was the first of its kind, a black man on a stage with all white boys and shit. And people did not like me for that. They couldn't understand me for that. You know what I'm saying? But I don't care what nobody say, Flavor Flavor is the one that broke the racial barrier in music. I broke that racial barrier. And I'm glad that yeah. I did. And when you guys did the Bring the Noise remix with Anthrax, that was the first time, you know, because I guess Run DMC had already done Walk This Way Walk with Aerosmith, way, right. but you guys did the hard rock. Right, we did the, the hard the rock time. shit. The hard, yeah, we laid it down. We, we really laid it down. Um, also, we came with one of the first rock rap records, which was called Sophisticated Bitch. Mm, off the first album. There we go. See, you know your mm -hmm. shit. Y'all sophisticated. Yep. And, and, and there was no other rock rap records around that time. We came out with the first one. Well, Flav, man, I know you got to go soon. Uh, but I, like I said, I'm absolutely honored that you would come and share your story with me. Thank uh, you. What you're part of is going to live on way past your lifetime. You know, you have, what, seven kids? I got seven children, and I got seven grandchildren. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Also, um, before I do leave you, um, one story that I do want to tell, which I feel is important for you to have and shit, you know what I'm saying? Um, back in the days, we were on tour with U2, with Bono and Edge and the boys, right? Whole nine. And uh, the name of that tour was called The Zoo Tour. And around that time, there were two states that was not honoring Dr. Martin Luther King's birthday. That was the state of Arizona and the state of New Hampshire. So... We were in protest when we went to Arizona. We would not perform in Arizona because they wasn't honoring Dr. Martin Luther King. So when we got to Arizona, now, mind you, we opened up for you 2 and you 2 they fill up a stadium with like 90,000 heads, 95,000 heads. So when we opened up for them, there's already like 75,000 heads 
in the audience already. You know what I'm saying? In the whole nine. And Public Enemy, I mean, we was we was hotter than fish grease, B. We was hot. I mean, we was burning up around that time. I mean, we was hot. We was blazing. And the, they wanted to see this Public Enemy show so bad. We got out on that stage in, in, in Arizona, and we did the record. By the time I get to Arizona, Zona, 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 right? Whole nine, we did that one record. After that, we all got down on one knee flat, put our hands up in the air, and then we walked off the stage. The crowd was an outrage, man. It was an outrage like crazy. Next thing you know, a lot of people got together that year. And I just want to feel proud to sit here, cross my heart, and say, the following year, Martin Luther King's birthday was born in the state of Arizona. Public enemy. Yeah, we, 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 we sparked the flame. I don't know no other musical group in history that's going to put a national holiday on the map. Well, we did it. Public enemy, we did that. I just wanted to, you know, give you a little piece of my bragging rights. <laughs> oh, yeah, man. Because I, I, I heard the song by the time I get to Arizona, yeah. but I never knew that you guys, and I know the song was based on Arizona not honoring Martin Luther yeah. King, but I never knew that you guys actually got that reversed. Yeah, that we're, the so ones, we're the ones that's responsible for the state of Arizona having a Dr. Martin Luther King's birthday. Public Enemy did that. You know what I'm saying? Dope, so. man. Dope. Well, Flavor Flav, man, once again, an honor. I'm such a huge fan and a fam. Like yeah, you said in you're the a beginning. huge fan. Uh, man, such an incredible story and such a such a body of work that will live on for such a long time. And like I said, you could play Fight the Power right now, and it is so relevant to what's happening in the world right now. Uh to this day, man, and, and and really, like for example, I remember when I interviewed Russell Simmons, he said that Public Enemy, you know, that that the producers, you know, that the sound really saved Def Jam. What you guys did sonically was so different. You know, everyone did loops and everyone sampled James Brown, but you guys brought that noise, that that dissonance, you know, those strange sounds that no one thought would work musically and put that together and created such a tapestry to, to what you guys did. And as dope as Chuck D is, Flavor Flav really just finished off the, the recipe to all those songs. I can't imagine, you know, these songs without Flavor Flav on them. You know what I'm saying? That, that it was just a, a perfect... A perfect storm at that time. And I remember, like, because people say, well, hip hop has always been, you know, about, you know, negativity and so forth. And I said, nah, at one point, Public Enemy was, was the center of the world and they were only preaching positivity. And people didn't wear gold chains, they wore African medallions during that mm -hmm. time. People, people dissed all the materialism and so forth. People don't, you have to be my age or older to really experience that. You know, you guys were a game changer and, you know, like I said, very honored to sit with you today. Thank you, Vlad. Thanks for having me too, man. And and I just want to let you know that I will be coming after you for my podcast. Because I'm going to do one do too. We're going to do it. Everybody's talking about talk to me into Chris. doing one, Vlad. You know what I'm saying? So being that they're talking me into doing this, I got to come after the, after the heavy hitters, the hard hitters. And you happen to be one of them. Yep. Shout out to Country Chris for helping make this happen, man. You know, and like I said, man, no truly doubt. an Country honor. Chris, to do this again. That's the man you can't resist. He's so potent that he comes out in your piss. <laughs> like vitamins. <laughs> that's what it is, man. Salute. Salute, man. Until next time. All right, Peace. salute. Thank you, Vlad.